the first high school graduating class of the 21st century in at first grade this September. They are our future workers and leaders, college students, taxpayers, parents of the 21st century. Many of them are off to a healthy start, but many millions of them are not. Tonight, one in four of them is poor. One in five of them is at risk of becoming a teen parent. One in six has no health insurance. One in seven is at risk of dropping out of school. One in two has a mother in the labor force, but only a minority have safe, affordable, quality childcare. And it's not just the 13 million poor children or the millions more in moderate income families who are still childcare poor, health insurance poor, housing poor, and higher education poor who are struggling still to keep their foothold in the American dream and who are very unsure about their economic futures. A growing number of our privileged youths suffer from spiritual poverty, afflicted by what John Levy of the Jung Institute labels affluenza. The symptoms include boredom, low self-esteem and lack of motivation, the products he suggests of the family wealth that insulates children from challenge, risk, and consequence. In increasing numbers, psychologists and psychiatrists are finding parallels between children of the urban rich and poor. Both, they say, suffer from broken homes and absentee parents and move around amid easily accessible drugs, alcohol, and sex. Willingness to protect children is a moral litmus test of any decent and compassionate nation and city and state. It is also a test of the common sense of a people seeking to preserve itself and their future. Now, there are going to be some who will raise the federal deficit as an excuse to neglect our children and families, and our children did not cause this deficit. I want to say to them that if the foundation of your national house is crumbling, you don't say you can't afford to fix it while building multi-trillion dollar fences to defend it from enemies without. Our children in New York City, in New York State, and all around this nation need defense against shameful and preventable infant mortality rates. A black baby born in some New York City neighborhoods and in our nation's capital is less likely to live to the first birthday than a baby born in Jamaica. And New York is not among the better states and making sure that its babies stay alive and that its mothers get cost-effective prenatal care, particularly those who are minority. This is bad policy. It's bad budget policy, too. It costs $600 to provide a mother cost-effective, adequate prenatal care. We're paying on the average $1,000 a day to try to save very low birth weight babies in neonatal intensive care nurseries just to keep them alive. Um, those who are born with handicaps and who may need special education or who may not be fully functioning adults cost us throughout their lifetime. What in the world is wrong with us that we can't put a floor of health decency, cost-effective health decency, under every poor mother and child? We're making progress, but we've got a long way to go. The Medicaid expansions of the last four years have been outstripped by the loss in private health insurance among millions of Americans. So we have the scandal of over 35 million Americans having no health insurance, and children and mothers suffer most. The philosophy that government is not the solution to our problems, government is the problem has contributed to a dominance of people who think the government of, as a presumptively illegitimate enterprise. If the public purposes of one's job are not considered a high calling, and if government has no purpose other than its own destruction, the restraint against unethical behavior in both the public and private sectors quickly erode. As a result, for every Michael Deaver and Lynn Nossinger, there is an Ivan Bosky and a Reverend Jim Baker and his Tammy. 
and we need a full-fledged congressional investigation just to figure out if Richard Secord's greed is public or private sector greed. And we know that truth-telling is no longer a precondition for public office if we just read the testimony of Assistant Secretary of State for Latin, for Latin America, Elliot Abrams and look and listen to many of our other political leaders whose indictments I can hardly keep t pace of in the newspapers today. Should we wonder then why so many of our children flounder as they shadow our adult steps? If the only principle our society adheres to is economist Adam Smith's invisible hand, it leaves little or no room for the hand of man or a woman or of God, whom the prophet Micah said enjoined us to be fair and just and merciful. There is then a hollowness left at the core of a society whose members share no mutual goals or joint vision, nothing to believe in except self-aggrandizement. Only a society with an ethical, eroded ethical base would allow more than a fifth of its children to live in abject poverty in the midst of the greatest affluence the world has ever known and have the audacity to think that it will not affect us all. Now we can do something about it. And the first thing we can do is not to despair and certainly Mayor LaGuardia never did that. This is a time to go to work as he did to meet the challenges that threaten our children, our families and entire nation. It will take time, energy, leadership, and a sustained investment of private sector and public resources, of effort by volunteers and by parents. Every American must speak out and help to redirect the misguided national investment priorities of this decade, which have placed missiles and bombs ahead of mothers and babies and families. Since 1980, with our permission, each of us has increased our spending on the military by 37 percent, on the national debt by 81 percent, and each American has decreased spending on all programs for low-income families and children by 2 percent. And don't please let politicians continue to blame spending on the poor for escalating deficits when they come in with next year's budget. Second thing we can do is that each of us must actively struggle to inform ourselves and pay more attention to what our political and private sector leaders do rather than what they say and hold them accountable. Convenient ignorance is a more deadly threat to the future of America than AIDS. It absolves us of responsibility to act and feeds a continuing politics of illusion and cheap redemption. And we must watch out for quick fix or politically cosmetic solutions to complex problems that we can only solve, we can solve, but only with patience and effort. Bonhoeffer told us that there is no cheap grace. Third, we must understand and be confident that each of us can make a difference, as Mayor LaGuardia did, by caring and acting in small as well as big ways. He understood, and we must understand, that democracy is not a spectator, but a participatory sport. Don't ask in the face of growing child and family suffering, homelessness, political timidity, and private sector indifference and corruption, why doesn't somebody do something? Each of us has to ask, as he did, why don't I do something?